Good morning and welcome to this week's edition of Encompass Live. I am your host, Krista Porter, here at the Nebraska Library Commission. Encompass Live is the Commission's weekly webinar series where we cover a variety of topics that may be of interest to libraries. We broadcast the show live every Wednesday morning at 10 a.m. Central Time. But if you're unable to join us on Wednesdays, that's fine. We do record the show as we are doing today and it is then posted to our website for you to watch at your convenience. And I'll show you at the end of today's show where you can access all of our recordings. Both the live show and the recordings are free and open to anyone to watch. So please do share with your friends, family, neighbors, colleagues, anyone you think might be interested in any of the topics we have on the show. Uh, for those of you not from Nebraska, the Nebraska Library Commission is the state agency for libraries here in Nebraska. We provide services to all types of libraries in the state. So you will find shows on Encompass Live and in our archives for all types of libraries, uh, public, academic, uh, K-12 schools, uh, corrections, museums, <coughs> archives, et cetera, et cetera. Really it runs the gamut, anything and everything. Um, we um, are really our only criteria here on Encompass Live on the show is that it's something to do with libraries, um, any type of library, anything libraries may be doing. We do book reviews, interviews, mini training sessions, demos of services, products, all sorts of things. Uh, we do bring in guest speakers sometimes, talk on the show, um, but we also have Nebraska Library Commission staff that do presentations for us. And that is what we have today. Um, joining me today is Sally Snyder. Good morning, Sally. Good morning. And she is our uh, coordinator of children and young adult library services here at the Nebraska Library Commission. And she has her annual presentation today about next year's summer reading program. Um, the theme being oceans of possibility. Um, so I'm just going to hand it over to you, Sally, to tell us about all the great books we could read next year. Thank you. I have approximately 72 books on my list, so we're, I'm going to try to get done in an hour, but we might go longer because I like, I have my script that keeps me on track so that I don't take too much time. Yeah, um, and yeah, and if we do go long, that's okay. Uh, people, anyone who's attending, you're welcome to. If you only allow me an hour for the present for the show today, that's fine. Um, leave if you feel the need to at the end. We'll just stay on as long as it takes for Sally to get through everything, and we'll have the full recording available for you afterwards. But there's just so many good books out there, of course. <laughs> <laughs> so the books that are on my list are ones that either we have received here at the Library Commission from publishers to consider for different lists. And also I look at the public library and I look at things online from other places. And sometimes I just buy the book because I gotta have that book. So there's a variety there. If your favorite book for the coming summer is not on my list, I am so sorry. But these are newer books for the most part because the summer reading program manual has some book lists in it. So I'm trying to hit things that are pro were probably too new to get on that list. And so let's get started with, oh, okay, there we go. Here we go. There we go. Fiction picture books. Cause a man in Brazil finds an exhausted penguin covered in oil on the beach near his home. and He nurses him back to health. The man knows the penguin needs to leave and find his own kind. And eventually the penguin does. But the next year at the same time, the penguin returns to spend several months with, a, with his friend. And this went on for several years, a number of years. And this is based on a true story. This really happened to this man in Brazil. So that's fun. And who wouldn't want to have a penguin for a friend? <laughs> um, and actually, I'll mention too, because I know, I know people will ask, um, the slides will be available afterwards as well. And Sally does have that handout you were just, you're just holding you. Yeah, will be available on our webpage as well. We have a page with handouts where um, that will be update, uploaded too. So, uh, I would say don't worry about trying to scribble down all these titles and authors and things that she's going through because you will have actual documents that will have all of this information. So just write down the word penguin like for that book. I want to look at the penguin. <laughs> <laughs> this one is fun. It's a play on the boy who cried wolf because the boy is sent to the top of the hill to watch for pirates. He calls out several times and each time his father comes up and corrects him and explains, 
A pirate ship looks like this. It has big sails. It doesn't have people rowing. Uh, and then next, the people on the pirate ship are dressed like this, and they don't look like those guys on that little rowboat over there. And so several times he has to be corrected as to what he's really looking for. But finally, the pirates do arrive, and everyone hides, but not for the reason you think. It has a trick to it, and it's a lot of fun. Javier and his father Tomas fish every day on their boat, Magdalena. Various seabirds flock around the boat and try to catch a fish from their catch. And one day, an albatross was caught on a hook. Uncle Philippe pulled it from the hook and tossed it on the deck. When they were cleaning up, Javier found it. It was still alive, and he hid it under a tarp. He later smuggled it to the storeroom behind their house, and using what little money he had, he bought fish and cared for her. Soon it was time for her to leave, but when he went to get her, she had, was gone. His father had sold her. So he found where she was, and he grabbed a wheelbarrow, put her in the wheelbarrow, and started running up to the top of the hill because he thought if she feels the air, she'll try to fly. Will she take off? Yes, she did. I couldn't help myself. Vivi, who loves science in the ocean and her class, go to a beach to study tide pools. They make aquascopes. Instructions are included in that part of the book. And they use them to observe what kind of plants and animals they find in a tide pool. There's a good story and also some good advice is sprinkled throughout the story. At the back of the book, it has a two page spread of additional information titled BV Science Facts. Una is a mermaid and she enjoys spending time with her otter friend Otto as she collects treasures she finds in the sea. But sometimes trouble finds them. There is one treasure Una cannot quite reach, a crown stuck in the rift. She has tried and tried to get it unstuck. She tries one more thing and finally she gives up, but she's lost her spark and that's not a good thing. Then she's sitting there and an unusual shell floats by. It could be just the right thing. It and Una's new goggles she invented. Yay! This one's so fun. New neighbors, a girl and her grandma, are not what Captain Swashby wants. He wants to live by the sea. He's retired by the sea. Him and the sea, they're good friends. Nothing else. But the people have moved in. He writes some messages in the sand, several different messages. But each time after he walks away, his friend the ocean washes away some of the letters. So when he wrote no trespassing, what the girl came out and saw was sing. So she did. She sang and he's getting grumpier. And uh, so the kids will, I think, will really love seeing these messages change from something grumpy to something uh, friendly and inviting. And, you know, it's only a matter of time before he decides it's okay to have neighbors. The seagull demonstrates that he is better than anyone at swiping food items from people. He can swipe this and swipe that and the people are mad because their sandwich is gone. Then along comes a cute crab and he charms snacks from people. Soon, the two of them are a team and are polite to all, willing to wait for a treat. So he changed his ways. This is told in rhyme, a boy and girl's parents hire a pi pirate, Long John Bacron, ship's cook, for their babysitter. First, what to feed the kids? Pirate stew. As soon as the parents leave, the entire ship crew arrives. They throw in all kinds of things into the stew and they sing their chant, which ends with, you'll become a pirate too, so the kids don't eat any of it. Then the house becomes a ship and it sails across the sky around the town and they end up at Sally's Donut Shop. Isn't it great that it's Sally's Donut Shop? <laughs> Here the kids leave the pirates at the saucy treasure chest and the ship takes them home, turning into a house was for. The parents arrive home, see the stew and grab a bite and they turn into pirates. Now, you can only imagine where they're going from there. You know you had a side gig going there, Sally. <laughs> What's that? You know you had that side gig going. <laughs> I did. <laughs> you stop by. The paperback, this is an older book, but the paperback just came out in May of 2021. Nellie loves her new swimsuit. It is just right. But when she and her mother go to the beach, Nellie avoids getting into the ocean. Water scares me, she says. She wears her swimsuit for all kinds of other activities, bike riding, 
going out to dinner and sleeping, mom takes her to visit grandma who has a swimming pool. Grandma was a champion swimmer and she takes time and patience to get Nellie into the water and to teach her to blow bubbles, float and move her arms to swim. The lessons work. Nellie loves swimming just like grandma. Whoops. Why am I in the wrong page? Oh, excuse me. A mother and her daughter pretend the bath is actually the sea with many creatures, dangers, and beauty. Don't forget it is also a lot of fun. Splashing, it seems, is okay with this mom. This is a wordless picture book. An African-American boy has a camera and he is taking pictures as he wanders away from his class who is visiting the ocean floor. He is concerned when he sees a submarine heading back to the surface without him, but he has a few watery friends who help him set up a light signal for when the submarine returns. All is well at the end of the book and the reader gets to see the photos he took. Alba loved living on her beautiful reef, but over time, more and more trash showed up on the reef floor. One by one, Alba's friends move away. One day she saw a beautiful pearl inside a plastic bottle. When she swam in to get it, she was trapped and she couldn't get out. She and the bottle floated along until a girl on the beach saw her. The girl put her into a bucket with some water and told the other people what had happened. The people worked together and cleaned up the beach and the reef. Alba could return home where she found many of her friends had returned as well. So it's a cautionary tale about what can happen with our ocean. There's another cautionary tale. <laughs> Pat, a fish in a bowl, is out in a rowboat with his best friend, Mike, who's an elephant. Mike is napping, so Pat jumps out of the bowl into the sea. He meets lots of colorful, friendly fish until the crab yells, hide, a shark is coming. But Pat cannot find a place to hide. All of the places are taken and the shark grabs him in his teeth. But what is this big thing coming down from the surface? It's Mike. He's going to be OK. Brief text and colorful illustrations will appeal to the young readers and listeners. A girl and her mother explore the many sides of the ocean while spending their day at the seashore. The girl says things like, my ocean is big, and shows, there's an illustration of that. My ocean is small, and shows a little bit of an ocean in her hand with uh, some sea creatures. Poetic and all-encompassing, it's a wonderful day at the beach. Noah must, Noah must wait on the beach while his Nana finishes fixing their boat. He is eager to sail out to find the seals. While waiting, he creates a sand seal and watches the waves with him. A storm comes along and Noah and Nana get into the beach boat to wait it out. Noah's seal is washed away after the storm. The boat is fixed, but Nana says they'll sail tomorrow until Nora, Noah sees a real seal right there in the ocean. They sail and it leads them to the rocks where many seals are resting. What a day. Captured somewhat by accident, an octopus endures captivity where they give him interesting things to do, but nothing changes. They put him in a glass house where there are no waves, no tide change, and the food comes every day at the same time. One night, he left out of the glass house, along the floor, under the door, and off to the sea. It's reminiscent of Inky's journey without the injury. I have that in the nonfiction section in a little bit. So you might decide between the two which one you might want to buy. They're both excellent. Kai, a merboy, loves to give squishes or hugs to his mom and anyone else around. But the puffer fish puffs up. He doesn't like squishes. He would rather have a fin bump. Kai finds out what type of contact other sea animals prefer, and soon he realizes that every fish likes their own kind of squish. It's a story about permission and learning what others prefer in a happy, friendly way. The bears who have been on chairs or in the snow and in a band, to mention a few, are now at the beach. Big brown bear is there to help while they build a sandcastle, but they have a little trouble. Eventually, they get it built. Little ones will love the bears working hard, but still enjoying the beach. And it's a good choice for story time. Okay, so this is not the ocean, but it is a fish. The fish bumps his nose on the side of his bowl and decides his house is too small. He walks away and tries some other houses. It isn't until the turtle tells him that he cannot breathe without water that he collapses. A girl runs to get him and puts him back in the bowl. Then she puts the turtle in with him. Now the bowl is not too small. He has a friend. 
Edgar is puzzled and frustrated by his designation as a jellyfish. Okay, the jelly part is fine, but he is definitely not a fish. He talks with some starfish who know exactly what he means. They are not fish either. Finally, Edgar decides to enjoy what makes him unique and not worry about what people call him. I only found this in a board book, but it's so fun, I just had to share it with you anyway. An octopus cannot find any underpants that take his eight legs into account. Then he finds the swanky undersea emporium that has something for everyone. Silly and fun with lots, lots of fish and underpants and other clothing items, hats, socks, jewelry, etc. The surprise ending is he realizes he doesn't have eight legs, he has eight arms. He needs a shirt, not pants. <laughs> Very silly. Two sailors, Albertini and George, are floating along on only a small part of their wrecked ship. When it starts to rain, Albertini thinks it is unfair. George says, it could always be worse. One after another, unfortunate things happen to, happen to them and none of it goes away. George continues to make his statement each time. And I have to point out that one of the things that happens to them is flying fish with diarrhea. So kids, kids will like that, I won't. <laughs> They end up on a small island with a cave, but when George puts out the fire, they see lots and lots of eyes looking down at them from the ceiling. George finally states, this does look bad. Albertini relights the fire to find an amazing surprise. It isn't so bad after all. Beautiful art carries the story told in brief text. Each two page spread has the wish of an inanimate object, wishing that they were larger, shorter, cooler, calmer, and more to help the family on their way to safety. Fleeing from Vietnam, the mother and three children walk away in the night and join others on a too crowded small boat. Their week's journey takes them to a big city. It could be Hong Kong. The author's note at the back indicates this journey is similar to the one she and her family took in 1980 when she was a baby. A child compares his life with that of a baby humpback whale. They both have a mother to watch over them. They both are growing and learning. The whale hits the water with her fin and makes a loud splash. The child can jump into the water and splash too. Beautiful art shows the whale's world. The title includes a note at the end of the book giving some additional information on humpback whales. Now we'll talk about some picture book nonfiction. Yusreth, living in Syria, was hoping to compete in the Olympic Games. Then the war came and to her country in 2015. Yusreth was 17 and she and her older sister were sent ahead. They flew to Istanbul, Turkey, and then took an overcrowded boat to the Greek island of Lesbos. But the engine quit and their boat took on water, water so the sisters and two others jumped into the, into the sea to guide the boat to the island. Eventually, they made it to Berlin, Germany, where their family later joined them. It is told in short four line with just two or three words per line poetry. For example, just a girl with a dream, Olympic games, swimming team. And the author has also written this book about Sakamoto Swim Club. Children of the field workers who cut the cane keep busy and cook off and cool off in the irrigation ditches in Hawaii. The policeman runs them off, but the science teacher Suichi Sakamoto asks permission to use the digits and train the children to compete in swimming. He gets to go ahead and works with the kids and eventually some of them decide to work towards the Olympics. And this is also told in the same way with the short poem, Swimmers Share Olympic Dream, Three Year Swim Club Forms the Team. A guessing game or puzzle, the author states several features of the animal on the next page asks the reader to guess and turn the page. This book is written for quite young readers, so the clues, along with a watercolor illustration of part of their body, will often result in a right answer. Most of the creatures are included are from the ocean with only a few freshwater choices to be named. So this is a fun story time choice. That'd have been a good one for this year's summer reading too. Oh, so. that's true. <laughs> good point. <laughs> In 1818, Jean Power decided to be a naturalist, studying animals and plants. She had just married, they moved to Sicily, and she left her dressmaking world behind. She taught herself, walking on the island with a notebook, talking to scientists on the island, and reading books. When she first became fascinated with marine life, she was the, 
She was the first person to design a particular aquarium in order to study them up close. Since scientists had been arguing for years about the shells of the paper nautilus, did they grow them or did they steal them, she placed eggs in one of her tanks and waited. The eggs hatched and she waited some more. Eventually, it became clear that the paper nautilus grew its own shell. She made other discoveries and kept careful notes, publishing her research when able, keeping her name attached to her findings. Told in rhyme and prose, this is the story of plastic, how it began and how it is now everywhere. Make, it makes it clear that we humans must reduce our production of plastic. The oceans are one main focus, especially the two page spread on the two great Pacific garbage patches, one on the east and one on the west. It includes a lot of additional information at the back of the book. This is another pioneering woman. Marie Tharp was born in 1920 and was not allowed to study the natural world until the men went off to war for World War II. She got a job in a laboratory, but was put on desk duty when the men returned to work. She analyzed the depth measurement data they brought back from their research trips. The data showed a deep valley in the floor of the Atlantic. No one believed her, so she did the work again. The valley was still there. Jacques Cousteau didn't believe her, and he sent cameras down deep into the ocean. His cameras proved her right. As it says in the book, Marie's map opened the door for us to a better understanding of our planet. A picture book biography of Mavini Betch, whose great grandfather in the 1930s bought a beach in Florida for black people and everyone to use without restrictions on where they could go. As an adult, Mavini was an opera singer singing around the world. She returned to Florida and American Beach when her mother became ill. The beach had deteriorated since beaches were no longer segregated. Mavini became the beach lady working to save the beach and other things in this world. Eventually, the American Beach became part of the National Forest Service. And this lady died in 2005. Here's Inky, a look at the octopus life cycle, how they are ready to live on their own right after hatching, what they eat, where they hide, et cetera. Then we focus on Inky. He had lost the ends of two tentacles before he was caught in a lobster trap, having likely eaten the lobster first. The fisherman noticed his wounds and took him to the aquarium in New Zealand. He recovered and he lived there for an unspecified time, except that he grew from the size of a baseball to the size of a soccer ball. One night, the keeper forgot to close the lid to Inky's tank tightly enough. That's all it took. The author provides a plausible fictionalized route for his escape, likely back to the sea. She also emphasizes that octopi are curious and that likely led to Inky escaping. And it includes an end note. So at the book, book I talked about earlier and this one are, are similar, but this one is uh, more factual until you get to how he got out of there, which was really a guess, but pretty likely. <laughs> I heard about that. I heard about that escaping. Oh, yes. oh yay. <laughs> you might have a book like this already. This was one at the library here, and it has excellent photographs, many close up, and text that the text relates the hatching and run to the sea of a clutch of leatherback sea turtles. So it's just as they hatch and as they run to the sea. And the kids are fascinated by that trip and to have good close-up pictures is, is a helpful thing for your collection. Sarah Gerhardt has been surfing from a young age beginning in Hawaii. She was the only girl learning to surf so she had to use boards and wetsuits designed for men. She loved big waves and one day in February 1999 in California she sat waiting for her wave at Mavericks, a famous beach known for its huge waves up to 50 feet high. No woman had successfully surfed a big wave there until Sarah. A timeline at the back of the book conveys the history of women and surfing. And there is a fold out page near the end of the book that gives a sense of the size of the wave she rode, which is very helpful, but also we know that that could get damaged as the book is used. We'll move on to beginning readers. We've had a couple of Little Penguin books before. The Little Penguin and his friends have discovered a strange object. It is not tasty, and it is not all at all comfy to sit on, but penguins love a mystery. Franklin thinks it could be a back scratcher. Reginald thinks since it part of it spins, it could be a feather driver. Maybe it is a kickball launcher. Creative thinking, solving a puzzle or not, and working together combine in this beginning reader. They never figure it out. 
more uh, more book about Clark the Shark. This is the first one that is in I Can Read Comic. So it's told in the comic format. Clark is ready for the school sing. He loves to sing. The class practice went well, but then he discovers there is a dance to go with the song. He cannot dance and sing. He keeps falling down. I can relate to that. The day of the event, their teacher tells the class to sing out and have fun, but they see the audience and they all freeze. Finally, Clark starts to sing and the class joins in. Their dance becomes a conga line instead and they have fun and Clark stays on his feet. <laughs> Ty looks out the window and it is a great day to go to the beach. He and his dad go to the sandbox and Ty imagines the beach. They build a sand castle and see some seagulls. Soon they are splashing in the water. We see them with water hoses. Soon Ty's friend Jazz joins them bringing his beach ball. Some imaginary surfing and it's time for ice pops. Great day. Art for the imaginary events is more childlike. So it's easier to see the difference. And it's a good example of imaginary play. A family of four pack the car and head to the beach for a glorious day. Short sentences will appeal to the new reader. Hot sand, run fast, dive in quick. Something tickles, seaweed, ick. <coughs> Fish tells his mom the ocean floor is dark and cold and boring. He says he is going out. Fish went up to the surface, but it was still dark and cold and boring. Then something amazing happens, the sun rises. Fish introduces himself and soon Sun and Fish are playing games. Then the sun turns red, explains that he is setting and he leaves. Fish is confused and lonely again. Going home, he has a tear in his eye. The next morning he goes to the surface again. His friend Sun is there and they agree to meet and play every day. Some early chapter books. Soroya and her fourth grade class are going to the aquarium, which Soroya loves. All of her classmates mates think she's a little weird because of her fascinations with the sea creatures so she seeks off to the immersion display there she thinks she saw something unusual it's a mermaid when she can finally talk with the mermaid she learns that she was accidentally caught in the net catching small fish to feed the aquarium fish she must get back to the sea soroya finds a bucket and a card and manages to leave the aquarium with estelle the bay is just across the street she gets in trouble with her teacher, but she does manage to get Estelle back to the sea and to her family. This is the book, the first book about Benny McGee and the shark. Benny must write a report for school, but when a real shark with lots of teach, teeth shows up in the rain while he is walking to school, he is caught off guard. He runs home at the end of school and he sees the shark riding a scooter around the house three times. He is circling his prey. His parents suggest Benny invite him in. So he does, and he learns a lot about sharks. He decides that bringing the shark to school would be perfect for his report. But the deep sea fisherman who was going to talk to the class tries to catch Mr. Chompers in, in his net. The shark must run to the sea. But after that, Benny was never afraid to go into the ocean. In this book, the illustrations are in blues and grays on every page. Now, Benny and Miggy and the shark are famous. Dewey, one of Benny's friends at school, does not believe Benny knows a shark. So Benny decides to shoot a video of Mr. Chompers eating cookies as Benny throws them to him. He gets permission to post the video online, although he kind of asked at a sneaky time. Soon they had six million views. The next morning, there were news trucks everywhere. How do they get out of this? In this one, the illustrations are in purples and grays on every page. I don't know if there'll be more or not. This is book number one in the Shelby and Watts series, and these, these are written in graphic novel format. Shelby, a fox fond of mysteries, and Watts, a badger fond of his encyclopedia, receive a letter from a hermit crab asking for help. There are no shells for him to move into, and he's in trouble. When they arrive at the shore, they spot their friend Artie, a rhino, hunting for treasures. He ports them down the shore where the good shells are. They find Fred, the hermit crab, on the beach, where then they go to the tide pools, where they find lots of different animals. At first, it seems they're just going in circles and not finding a solution. Then Shelby realizes something and solves the mystery. So far, there's three books about Kondo and Kazumi. This is book one, they visit Giant Island. Kondo and Kazumi live in a world similar to ours, but 
but with some very different animals and possibilities. They live on an island and one day they find a map in a bottle. Kazumi, the small orange one, wants to build a boat and go exploring. Kondo, the big yellow one, does not. Eventually, they sail away from home and they find an island made of cheese, Dairy Island. Yum! As they venture off, a storm blows up and soon they are lost. But there's an island nearby. It has a talking mountain named Albert on it. Albert doesn't want them to leave, so he blows away their boat during the night. They work it out and they build a new boat and promise to visit again. And they head off for new adventures, which is Kondo and Kazumi reach Bell Bottom. The friends are sailing for Spaghetti Island. They are tired of eating coconuts. When a large school of sea jumpers knocks their boat around and gets them off course, they find an island that is not on the map, and then they realize it is an abandoned ship overgrown with plants. They have a couple of disagreements and both feel bad about it. They do discover what Bell Bottom really is, and when they finally get to Spaghetti Island, it isn't at all what they expected. It is the spaghetti. It ends with, and they never argued again, except when they did. Book three, they are not alone. Kondo and Kazumi are on their way home by way of a couple more islands. They arrive at their home island in the evening and something does not seem right. They have been gone a long time. When they reach their home in the tower, it looks different in the dark. They find slime on the floors and something with two long snaky arms that scares them away. In the morning, they go back to see what is there. After another bit of a scare, they find a new creature named Susan. She had found a map too and came to their island. They found a better place for Susan to live and spent time together every day. The last page says, absolutely not, the end. So there may be more. This is book one in the Wind Riders series. Max and Sophia find a magical sailboat thanks to a seagull and travel to Hawaii in an instant to help some sea turtles hatch and find the ocean. It's a good adventure story with environmental information included in the action. And Amazon says this is book one of three, though I don't know what the next two will be about yet. Fiction for grades two to five or so. We'll start with Eva Evergreen, Semi-Magical Witch. Ava gets her assignment to work for her novice witch rank at the coastal town of Otteri. Her magic is small, as is her confidence, but she knows practice will help make her magic stronger. She has an odd quirk. When she uses magic, she gets tired and has to sleep. No other witch has to rest as much as Eva. Still, she does her best to help the people of the town. Her magical repair shop begins to get business and her efforts help in unexpected ways. Then she learns that a huge magical storm is headed for the coast and for our Terry, and she must find a way to protect and defend the town. The sequel, Eva Evergreen and the Cursed Witch is now available, though I haven't read it. Pet in Barbados, Josephine, 11, is determined to keep her widower father from finding a girlfriend. She is also eager to play on the school's cricket team, but the coach is against it. Then a new woman comes into their lives, Maurice. She is beautiful and loving, but also does not like to be contradicted. It isn't long before strange things are happening, and Josephine comes to the conclusion that Maurice is a sea creature from Caribbean folklore, and she will not be easy to defeat. See her back there in the background behind the girl. Took me about three looks at the book cover before I saw the woman behind her. Half sisters Stella and Josie, only four months apart, will start will be starting high school in the fall. Since they only get together for the summer on the Jersey Shore with their dad, Josie, who lives in Australia, is ready for all their usual fun. Stella is hoping to change their image to almost high schoolers. Another big change this year, year is their much loved flavored ice store, Water Ice World is gone and a new smoothie store has taken its place. It isn't long before Josie and Stella realize they have stumbled into a mystery. Something strange is up and they are determined to find out what is going on. Told in alternating chapters of now, when each is talking with the police detective and the recent past. It's a good mystery, they have good friends and potential boyfriends and it's a satisfying summer read. Princess Noah, 12, her older brother, Prince Julian, 16, and Princess Might, 5, must flee their land when someone kills their mother. Julian should be king now, but they are in exile. Julian's magic keeps their moving island afloat, and his bargain with a sea serpent keeps them from being spotted by their em enemy, Xavier Whitethorn, who had their mother killed for a coup. Noah keeps an eye on her brother as she knows his magic can affect him, and he could end up as an evil dark lord. Betrayal and danger face them all 
but Noah is the best of them at strategy and unexpected moves. Can they regain their kingdom? Betsy K. Glory 8 has purple hair, an ice cream making father, and a mermaid mother in this whimsical story full of unusual characters. They live on an island left off of the map of the world, but they are not distressed about that. Mr. Tiger arrives via his ship, bringing with him his circus made up of gongalong acrobats, people much smaller than the usual humans. The problem to resolve is Princess Albie of Gongalong, an island now living on the island left off the map of the world, has been turned into a toad by her half sister, Princess Olaf. <clears throat> Mr. Tiger has an idea of how to solve it, involving a blue moon and the help of most everyone. The quirky plot and solution will entertain readers who will also enjoy the satisfactory conclusion. It uses a dyslectic friendly type and blue ink for both the text and the illustrations inside the book. And book two is Mr. Tiger, Betsy, and the Sea Dragon. Traditionally, the Sea Dragon leaves her eggs with the people of the island left off the map of the world, and the people care for it and protect it until it hatches. She lays an egg every 50 years, so this is the first time for many of the townspeople. Pirates arrive on the island, and they are looking for the forest of golden apples, and they do not believe that it is actually under the sea. The apples in the Sea Dragon's forest turn golden when it is time for their, eggs to hatch, their egg to hatch. The pirates switch a hen's egg for the egg the people are protecting, and they hold the real egg for ransom. Three crates of golden apples. Never fear, there may be some way for Mr. Tiger and Betsy to outwit the pirates. Th this one also uses the dyslexic friendly type and blue ink for the text and illustrations. Clara lives with her parents on an island tourists call exotic, but to her it's just home. She used to love the ocean and surfing, but last summer something major happened and she doesn't remember it now, and she is afraid of the water now. Her best friend, Gaina, is being rather unfriendly and has started teasing her that she can't remember anything, even yesterday. But she can remember yesterday. A new girl of Clara's age comes to the island and enjoys Clara's company. Maybe Gaina will rethink her moody treatment of her. Finally, several things come to a head at the same time, and it is now time for Clara to remember what happened and to understand what she needs to do next. This is book two in the Mouse Watch, but you can read it without reading the first one. It's associated with the rescue rangers from TV. Bernie, or Bernadette, and Jarvis, a rat, are the newest members of the Mouse Watch, an organization dedicated to saving the world. They are continuing their training with Ber Bernie eager to get real assignments and Jarvis looking forward to their next meal. Due to circumstances, Bernie and Jarvis are the only Mouse Watch members available for the vital assignment which involves scuba diving to a sunken ship that has a valuable item on board. Can they save the day? We sure hope so. This is set in 2017. Samira, her brother and her parents are now refugees in Bangladesh after fleeing their home in Myanmar, formerly Burma. They're Rohingya, an ethnic group and Muslim. The Rohingya lost their recognition from the Myanmar government, after which prejudice against them slowly increased in attacks and home, burning of homes. Now, in Bangladesh, Samira sells hard-boiled eggs each day to the tourists on the beach. Her father works on a shrimp boat and her brother works in a nearby restaurant. Her mother tends their chickens and cares for the one-room shack that's their home. Samira makes some friends, other girls who are selling things to the tourists, and when all is sold, the other girls like to try surfing, on the waves. Samira is afraid of the water after seeing her two grandparents get swept away by the river when they were es escaping to Bangladesh. But after some time she tries it and finds it as fun and freeing. When they learn there is a surf contest coming up and the prize is money, all of them want to win it for their families. This is book two in the Definitely Dominguita series. In this one, Dominguita, or Dom for short, is in third grade, and her she and her abuela used to read books together all the time. Now her abuela has moved to Florida to live with her sister, and Dom misses her. In this book, the, Dom and her new friends, Poncho and Steph, are imitating Treasure Island, except they found a real treasure map in, a book, in that book at the library. It could be treasure, it's really money stolen from a grocery store, and they will absolutely return the money if they find it and they are on the trail. Uh, Dominguita is Cuban American. Her friends are um, in the background there with her. She loves puzzle solving and also doing what's right. <coughs> Book one of seven says Amazon, the secret explorers 
This one is about the lost whales. Eight kids, each with their special expertise, make up the secret explorers. This book involves Connor, a marine life expert, and Roshni, a space expert, taking a submersible to locate and redirect a pod of humpback whales to get them back on their usual route to Antarctica. They have a few obstacles to, to overcome, but they do not quit. There's at least one illustration on every two page spread that helps to carry the story along. Rusty 10 has to attend summer school since he flunked math. When he can, he spends time taking care of his sailboat. While at the dock, an old lady in a wheelchair comes up to him to talk. Then she asks for a ride in his boat. Her name is Hazel and they soon become friends. She hires him to do odd jobs around her house. Every day she gives him time to get started on his homework and then they do something fun and interesting. Her curiosity about his day and the things they do together help him master his homework. Rusty's mom is not around this summer because she's in a facility to help her regain her health and spirit. She's got a bad, bad depression. Finally, Rusty gives Hazel a ride on his boat and they have a wonderful time. He has passed math and is done with summer school so he doesn't see Hazel again until he stops by her house and finds out she's in the hospital. He manages to see her that one last time and they relive their wonderful day of sailing. Jake 11 is sent to Dewey's Island near Charleston, South Carolina to spend the summer with his grandmother, Honey, while his mom stays in the, in the hosp hospital with his dad, who is slowly recovering from an IED attack. At first, he is stunned. He has culture shock, practically. He accidentally lost his phone on the boat over, and Honey has no TV or Wi-Fi. He is completely cut off from all his friends and, and everything he expects. Also, he is expected to do chores every day. He quickly realizes how much there is to do and learn on this special island. New friends, Macon and Lovey, her name is Olivia, are soon with him every day, and they begin to help the, the turtle nest watchers with their tasks to look for tracks every morning, early every morning, to see if any new nests have been made. The author of A Wolf Called Wander now gives us a story of an orca family. Vega, an adolescent orca, and her younger brother, Deneb, are separated from their pod, and then they experience, out in the ocean, the tsunami that's going to hit break on the shore, and it disorients them and then tosses them around. The water is murky. They don't know where they are. Finding their way back home may be impossible, but Vega is a future wayfinder for her pod, and she is determined to succeed. It's a fictional look at the lives of whales, based on facts, of course. <coughs> Translated from the Dutch, this won several prizes in the Netherlands. Lampy, the lighthouse keeper's daughter, has kept things running for her and her father for a while now, but she can be forgetful. The night of a bad storm, she is out of matches. She tries to get some, but she fails. Lampy is sent to the Admiral's Black House as a maid, and her father is imprisoned in the lighthouse and forced to light it every night, though meals are delivered to him daily. Lampy soon be befriends the monster in the house, who is actually a merboy but he calls his tail a deformity. Over time, people left at the house waiting for the Admiral's return come to support each other. When finally the Admiral does return, he is done with foolishness and has decided to get rid of his son, the merboy. He's going to sell him, but he has not encountered a determined Lampy before and things may not go the way the Admiral wants. This is book two of um, Astronauts. Five animals have been in training for the inevitable. We have to find a different planet to live on. And now it seems that our, their time has come. In book two, they are sent to the water planet to conduct tests and determine if it will be suitable for humanity's new home. Alpha Wolf, once again, is shirking his responsibilities. President P.T. Clam of the water planet proposes that we trade planets. After taking the astronauts on a very carefully guided tour, Alpha Wolf is in favor of agreeing to the switch. Possibly bogus charts and graphs are used to support the switch. All but Alpha Wolf note that they must complete their reports before making a decision. Will we be trading planets? Are we doomed? The second title is as wacky as the first. Very wacky and crazy stuff going on. Of course, look who it's by, John Cheska. It's goofy and fun. Some nonfiction for grades two to five or so. <clears throat> Everybody's gonna need this book, I'm pretty sure. <laughs> This their expected format that contains many torn and cut paper illustrations of lots of sharks, and that will attract readers. Basic information about sharks in general and some sp specific information 
about particular species is given. A number of pages show the shark's sizes compared to an adult human. Sure to grab browser's attention if the book gets put on display. Um, Kate Messner has written several his history smashers books. These, are, these two on my list are the only ones I've read so far, but they're very good. Well researched, this title and this series address the rumors associated with well known events. Here, the author begins with some background, both on World War II and the Japan's place and politics in the Pacific at that time, as well as some history on Hawaii. Details of the attack and the aftermath are given, including first person accounts of where people were and what they saw and experienced. The main myth that is debunked is that the attack was completely unexpected. Several people had seen the signs and warned of the likelihood of an attack, and U.S. military leaders had considered the threat and suggested air patrols around Oahu, but those did not happen. So you get a good history of, of the event and the time and place, and then the debunking of the myth. The other book that I have on the list is about the Titanic. In this title, she starts with the building of the Titanic and some about its sister ship, the Olympic. It follows the timeline of the Titanic's maiden voyage across the Atlantic and the tragic disaster of its sinking. Some of the myths that are debunked is the number of life, lifeboats. Yes, it did not have enough for anyone, everyone on board, but they were not required to. It actually had four more lifeboats than they were technically required to have. That's changed, of course, now. Also, another myth was what songs the band was playing while the ship sank. It, it turns out there were actually two bands playing different melodies in different parts of the ship. I never knew that before. The author also covers the efforts many years later to find the Titanic on the ocean floor. It's fascinating information for any readers who want to know more about the Titanic. Each three page spread, because one page is folded over and, and it opens out to reveal the real animal. It at first shows a fanciful creature and then opens up to show the real thing. And you can see how someone thought that creature was this other fanciful thing. There are some weird animals in the ocean. There are 12 strange and little known animals offered as the strangest thing in the sea. Which one will you choose? In 2002, an approximately two year old female orca was spotted swimming alone in Puget Sound off the coast of Seattle. This was too strange. Female orcas stay with their mothers throughout their lives, living with their close family in a pod. Mark Sears went out to check, and yes, she was alone. How they found out who her pod was, checked her health, and planned to reunite her with her pod is all chronicled in this book. Interspersed with at least one illustration on every two-page spread, this is an attractive, well-researched -re memoir of the event. And we'll move on to some teen titles. First fiction for younger teens. Olivia, 13, and her older sister, Ruth, 16, are traveling via RV with some family friends back to California for a visit. Ruth has been dealing with depression, and Olivia is keeping an eye out in case, in case Ruth goes back into the pit. Olivia is hoping to recreate the fun they had on their trip moving to Tennessee, but many things are different now. Ruth spends a lot of time listening to music on her old school iPod. Olivia has a new waterproof camera and she loves taking pictures. Olivia is eager for Ruth and her to reach their old stomping grounds in California and dig up their treasure box they buried three years ago on their favorite beach. Ruth is not that interested. So this is about family and sisters, points of interest along their route, depression, therapists, and photography. Hazel is 12 and her, her younger sister Peach they both have been traveling with Mama for two years, ever since the accidental death of Mama's wife, Mum. Hazel was Mum's child and Peach is Mama's. They will now live in a small coastal town in Maine for the summer. Just as they are settling in, their neighbor stops by to say hello and, find, and they discover that she is Mama's best friend from when she was in school. Hazel just wants to go home to California and an old friend of Mama's could nix that. The friend, Claire, has a 12-year-old daughter too, Lemon, Hazel alternates between being friendly and kind and being sharp and almost nasty to Net Lemon and her friends. We learned that Hazel was, was with mom in the kayak when the accident happened, and she still needs help to recover from this loss. Along with loss and grief are some good times with new friends and a determined belief in the local legend, a mermaid called the Rose Maid. Love and family will bring Hazel and her family together again right after a near tragedy. 
a graphic novel about the legend of Grace O'Malley. It's full color. It's book four in the Heroes and Heroines series by the author and illustrator. It is the legend of the 16th century pirate told in a straightforward manner. O'Malley is determined and a skilled sword fighter fighting for her native Ireland against the English. Readers of this graphic novel are likely to hunt up more information on her life and legend. Lewis, 12, hides in the hover car to go with his father, but now his father is forced to take Lewis along on his and his assistant Hannah's trip down to Atlantis to finally prove its existence. Kaya, 14, lives in Atlantis and has always been curious about the people of the sun. Do they really exist? What is their world like? When Lewis and his father and Hannah reach Atlantis, they are considered invaders and are being pursued by a secret group called the Erasers. Kaya and her friend Ryan help the Sun People and guide them through the city and their seemingly unusual way of life, at least unusual to the Sun People. They'll look at how people might react to encountering strange and unexpected beings. The assumption by the Erasers that the three visitors are up to no good is eye-opening when thinking about other encounters between human beings. Max, 12, and his older sister, Yala, have lived in Flood City all their lives. It is the only place above water in all the Earth, ever since the floods. The chemical barrens circle above the Earth wanting to return. The Star Guard, big blue aliens, protect Flood City from the barrens. When a barren ship attacks Flood City, all is in chaos for the night. Max encounters a wounded young baron, Ato, who's 12, and brings him home to his mother, who's a doctor. This attack starts a new revolution by the citizens of Flood City. Lots of action and short chapters keep the reader engaged. It's told from several different viewpoints. The chemical barons are overwhelmingly white and the citizens of Flood City are primarily people of color. So you get a sense of why they're still there and the other guys are up in space. This is a full color graphic novel. Morgan Kwan, 15, has a plan keep a low pro profile and leave her island home for college so she can be completely herself, gay. She believes her friends won't understand. As the book opens, she has accidentally hit her head and fallen off the rocks into the sea. She is rescued by Kelty, who is a Selkie. Morgan believes she is hallucinating and gives Kelty a kiss. This enables Kelty to look human and follow Morgan to her house. She tells Kelty they must be secret and Morgan's friends wonder why Morgan seems to be avoiding them and spending so much time with Kelty. Concern for the environment is a subplot as Morgan's friend Serena's parents bought a large boat for tours. They plan to go right by the sealed rookery. Morgan is stiff and in control of her feelings and her life all the time, and Kelty is carefree and loving. And I have one book on the fiction for older teens list. Valora Luck, 17, has a room on the Titanic. Unfortunately, the elderly English lady she worked for passed away before their sailing. She manages to get on board and ends up pretending to be Mrs. Sloan, her former employer, and traveling in first class. She must find her brother who's traveling in D class. Her plan is to convince him to rejoin her as acrobats. A man connected with the Ringling Brothers Circus is on board. If they perform for him, he could get them jobs and into the US in spite of the Chinese Exclusion Act. Her brother is not interested. Plenty of adventures and activities before the expected and unavoidable conclusion. Still, it says at the beginning of the book, of the eight Chinese passengers aboard the Titanic, six survived. And thank you. I made it in time. I can't believe it. <laughs> <laughs> hey, it can happen. <laughs> I should, I should uh, return the control to you. Um, well, you can keep it there for now. Um, okay. I'll, I'll handle, I'll take care of that, not a problem. Okay. Uh, all right. Yes, we did. We made it in under an hour today. Thank you so much, Sally. Uh, do you have other, sometimes you have others on your list that you don't mention during the show, or is it was, you know, Oh, yes, there's, there's a few, um, well, let's see what happens if I, if I go down. Wait, what am I doing? Why isn't it working? I have to end show. Oh, that's because I, there are some older or series titles. For example, um, Jane Yolen has a series called School of Fish. I think there's five books in that series. And Rocking the Tide is one of them that I read, which is a, an, a beginning reader and it's a lot of fun. 
they're having a great time, but then they, they get stage fright. Are they going to be able to perform? And then there's this older title, which is really pretty amazing. They have these actual sea creatures. There's one that's a, a cookie, a chocolate chip cookie starfish. <laughs> there's another thing that looks like a fried egg. I don't remember what it was, but they're very interesting. Mm -hmm. And then there, the last one is Shark Lady, who is about um, a woman who really thought sharks got a bad rap. And she trains a shark to do things that we usually think dolphins do. That shark could do it just fine. Jump in when you wanted to retrieve things. So yeah, sharks got a bad rap early on. And those are the three I have on the, the extra list. Awesome. All right. Um, thank you, Sally. Um, does anybody have any, um, no, no comments or anything came in during this presentation. Does anybody have any questions or comments or uh, other titles that you might suggest for uh, next year's Oceans of Possibilities, some reading program uh, topic? Um, oceanography is the theme. Uh, I always like having Sally come on and do these sessions. They've been um, coming up with the children's titles and teen books. Uh, having them right before all the holiday season is, uh, I mean, the purpose for this is for next year's summer reading. However, it's a very convenient, I always find, uh, right before the holiday season, I always get ideas from my nieces and nephews. <laughs> That's good. I'm taking notes of like, oh, I could buy that one for so-and-so. <laughs> Uh, we just got a lot of thank yous, uh, some great books. Thank you, thank you. Awesome. And oh, and feeling inspired. Good. Oh, yeah. yeah. That's great. I was hoping someone would suggest one more book I have to find and read. <laughs> so I am reading books for next month's Encompass Life and books for January's Encompass Life, too. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. getting, getting a few more. More ideas, yeah. All right. Uh, as I said at the beginning, in case you weren't here, um, the slides will be available when we get the recording posted. Um, and the uh, actual handout the, where Sally uses with her notes um, about all of the different titles will also be um, uploaded as well. So when we have that recording up and ready for you, um, you'll have access to all of that information. So you have all the details of the author's titles and everything um, will, be, will be available when we get the recording up. So I am going to pull presenter control back to my screen now. There, yeah. And so this is a session page for today. Uh, if you go to our main Encompass Live website, if you use uh, your search engine of choice and type in Encompass Live, we're the only thing called that on the internet at the moment, no one else is allowed to use our name. <laughs> you will come up with our webpage. We have our upcoming shows here. Um, and right underneath them is a link for to the archiving for slide shows. The most recent ones are at the top here. So today's will be at the top of the list. Uh, should be done by the end of the day tomorrow uh, with all the, I've got to upload to YouTube, work with go to webinar. Sally has to get her um, presentations uploaded. Um, but by the end of the day tomorrow, we should have this all ready for you to go. Uh, everyone who attended today's show and registered for today's show will get an email directly from me letting you know that the recording, when the recording is ready, you can go here to look at it. Um, we also pushed out on our various social media, Twitter, Facebook, etc. While we're here, I will show you this is our show archives. We, we do have a search feature here. You can look up any topic you might think of that um, see if we did a show on it. We, uh, you can search the entire archives or you can limit it to just the most recent 12 months if you want something very current. Um, that is because this is our full show archive and I'm not going to scroll all the way to the bottom because it's, if you can see it's a very long list. Um, this goes back to the very beginning of Encompass Live which was in January 2009. That was when we premiered the show. So we have over 10 years worth of show recordings here. So if you are uh, doing a search and watching a show, just pay attention to in the recording to the original broadcast date. They they are all um, have that on here, so you know when it, the show originally happened. Uh, some of the information will be still be good and valid and useful depending on the topic, but some things may become old and outdated. Uh, information uh, services and products may have changed. 
things may have disappeared. Uh, things may no longer exist. Links may be broken. Uh, so just pay attention if you are watching any of our archives. Uh, I said we do. Um, we have a Facebook page, which I have open up here. Wait, no, here. <laughs> we have a Facebook page for Encompass Live. So if you like to, if you do use Facebook, give us a like over there. We get reminders about our upcoming shows. Here's a reminder to log into today's show. Uh, when the previous show's recording is available, any notifications that they may be of interest to people interested in Encompass Live. Uh, we also post onto Twitter and Instagram and using the uh, we have a little abbreviated hashtag and comp live for the show so anything else anything there you'll find us in that hashtag um, we do a question about um, certificates of attendance uh, yes uh, about an hour from now everyone who attended today's show will receive an email automatically generated from the go to webinar system letting you know saying thank you for attending and this serves as your proof of attendance um, it is only it is sent out to everybody who actually logged in um, live. So you should get that email uh, within an hour from now. And that will serve as your proof of attending today's show that you can use if you need that for your own CE uh, continuing education purposes. So that will wrap it up for today's show. Uh, I hope you join us. Um, Sally did mention she's got a couple other shows coming up. Uh, Best New Children's Books of 2021 on December 8th. And uh, then on January 5th, um, teen titles. Um, the first show of 2022 will be uh, the teen titles, um, that's the teen titles of 2021 books they will read. So if you're, in, if you're specifically in needing to know children's titles or teen titles, definitely show up um, and for either of those two shows coming out. And next week, right before the Thanksgiving holiday, our, it is our pre-sweet tech day. Um, the last Wednesday of every month on Encompass Live is pre-sweet tech when uh, Amanda Sweet, our technology innovation librarian, comes on and does something techie related. Uh, we have other shows related that are tech potentially, but always hers are. And she's going to talk about the um, Oculus Quest 2 VR headsets in the library. This is something new that is, um, has come out, Oculus Quest to replacing the original one. Uh, we uh, loan tech kits here through the Library Commission, and this is one of the things we have, and she's going to focus in on this um, so you can see what it's like, how it works, and how you might be able to use one in your library on next week's Encompass Live. Uh, pretty sweet tech about Oculus Quest 2. So please do sign up for that show and any of our future shows. Any final words, Sally? Just um, happy reading and hope you have a, a wonderful Thanksgiving. Yeah, and um, let her know if you do have any ideas, ideas for other titles she can add to those lists. She's always looking for new ideas. <laughs> All right, so that wraps up for today's show. Thank you, Sally, for being here with me today. We'll see you next month. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. um, and hope we'll see all of you uh, in a future time on Encompass Live. Bye-bye. Bye, everybody.